<clears throat> okay, welcome everyone to our weekly webinar for the Escalate Mobile Learning Special Interest Group and also for our Scholarship of Technology Enhanced Learning Research Cluster. And uh, this week we're discussing with um, Ben Soltani uh, some of his research. He's doing some really interesting re research around um, graduate capabilities and the link between um, higher education and work uh, integrated learning. Um, so no, I think I met Ben last year, I think it was. Um, so just over a year ago, I think, at, uh, in, in Amsterdam, I to them in a conference. Uh, it was the Ed Media Conference, and um, it was just nice to meet someone from from New Zealand there. And, and Ben had his whole family there, so uh, mm -hmm. it was great to meet the family. And uh, it was just great to brainstorm ideas and to find someone who had very similar ideas around uh, developing creative uh, creativity in students, going beyond competency, looking at developing capabilities, and and uh, graduates who are really able to to um, you know live and work in, in, a, in a, a real world rather than the the uh, what we tend to do is pump them out with a set of competencies that um, they then got to try and apply in the real world so it was great to sort of knock around those ideas so I've asked Ben to give us a bit of an overview of his research today um, and just before he does that we also have Neil Neil from uh, all the way from Japan joining us as one of our participants today and we also have Brioni so Brioni's in Australia. Whereabouts in Australia are you, Brioni? So I'm at, I'm at QUT in Brisbane. Um, and I'm a learning designer in the science and engineering faculty. Great. Great to have you on board today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So I'm just going to hand over to Ben. And uh, Ben, if you just want to talk about some of your research, um, I think you said you've got something to show and we can ask questions as we go along. So thank you, Ben. Um, kia ora koutou everyone. Um, thank you Tom for inviting me for um, this presentation to talk about the research I have been doing. So um, as Tom pointed out, I have been researching um, capabilities in the learners, um, the staff, I've been in interviewing employers, um, and I have um, conducted ethnographic studies on the capability construction um, among these various um, groups. So the question which, um, well, the topic I'm going to talk about today is what makes graduates employable, basically? In order to find out answers to this question, I carried out um, 50 interviews with employers from diverse you know, sectors, including ICT, and construction, and quantity surveying, um, hospitality, and business in general, all across New Zealand. Um, I used qualitative in-depth interviews to elicit the um, employer's perspectives about what they actually look for to see in a graduate. So what kind of capabilities, what kind of experience, what kind of knowledge, what kind of expertise, you know, they were looking for in order to um, employ that particular individual. So the concept of um, graduate employability has been defined from two opposing discourses. One considers graduate employability as an amalgamation of skills, attributes, um, qualities, skills that individuals, you know, graduates need to display in order to become employable. Uh, different institutes have got different um, capabilities. You know, for example, the University of Sheffield has come up with 108 capabilities that they think you know would make graduates employable. Otago Polytechnic has come up with 25 capabilities that well this claim that you know will make graduates employable. But there is also another perspective which looks at capabilities from a process oriented approach. Um, and that 
looks at graduate employability from um, you know a global perspective how the global market for example is positioned nationally and internationally so there are three different aspects that this particular perspe perspective looks at one is the macro um, level that is how the market is positioned you know in various fields for example in IT um, both within for example in my case in New Zealand and globally and the meso level that is how um, you know what kind of activities the educational institutes and the workplace do to make um, the individuals employees graduates employable um, for the educational um, part for example um, what kind of activities um, the student success um, do student success team do uh, in the institution to prepare these individuals for the world of work teaching and learning the activities that teaching and learning um, do to um, better prepare the individuals for the unforeseen you know conditions and situations um, in the world of work and so the meso aspect looks at the institutional more institutionalized aspect of graduate employability the micro aspect looks at how individuals how graduates experience the um, social space of the workplace and what kind of experiences they have in order to be able to function well within that context so the research that i conducted positions itself in the second or the latter perspective rather than the first one so it looks at the more process oriented approach um, i used in vivo 11 to analyze the data i collected from uh, the um, employers uh, from these different uh, sectors and there were five different themes that emerged from the data these themes included uh, cultural capital social capital psychological capital identity capital and human capital well um, today i'm just going to focus on one particular aspect of this research and then we're going to have some uh, i'm going to share some extracts from the employers and then i would like you to react to that data so i would like you to share your experience because you are professionals in the field and i would like you to to share your thoughts your experiences with me and how you think we can use this information with our learners in our educational context so and the concept of uh, sociocultural capital is defined as uh, those um, psychological resources that are available to the learners which could help them to be able to um, you know actively and proactively engage with the unforeseen conditions in the world of work the real world so um, in the research i conducted there were a few themes which um, emerged I don't know if you can see my screen, can you? No, not yet. No, no, okay. So uh, these themes were just like uh, displaying a growth mindset, resilience and adapting to change, being aware of what one knows and not know and using it as an opportunity to learn and also um, learning from mistakes. So I'm just going to share my screen okay. okay can you see my screen no 
No, still yeah. no, your video. Okay, now we can. Okay, cool. Excellent. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, I would like you to first go through um, these extracts in two minutes. And then after that, uh, we will start talking about these. So there are four different extracts um, and we will have two minutes to go through these extracts. Yeah, I guess, please get us started. Ben, could you scroll down a little bit? I can only see sure. the first two. Thank you. So these are pretty much characteristics that we don't really uh, usually target in the, in the uh, teaching and learning process, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> it's um, often when I, when I was teaching, um, I would quite often get employers email me or ring me up and, uh, and you know, ask who, who would I recommend as a potential graduate for them to employ? And uh, it was always, you know, the people that you would recommend were the people who had really good people skills, not necessarily the brainiest in the class mm. um, or the one with the highest marks, but the person with the, with, the, with the really good people skills. And that's what employers really wanted. They wanted someone willing to learn, someone who was able to work in a team, um, someone that they could get on with and, and uh, you know, was willing to, um, yeah, just... Uh, uh, work in an environment that they was new to them and uh, perhaps they were a little bit uncomfortable with. Yeah, yeah, cool. Excellent. So um, if you're finished with uh, the reading, then we can go to the first task. So compare and contrast the notions of growth mindset and a fixed mindset and the relationship to graduates' ability to build potential. Discuss how we can promote a growth mindset among learners. So what are your thoughts, uh, you know, based on your own experience with your own learners? How could we promote that growth mindset among our learners? Yes, yes Neil? Neil. <laughs> um, this, is, this is not from um, experience with learners, but just... Uh, um, I went to a talk recently about growth and fixed mindsets and, you know, the Carol Dweck kind of psychology stuff. And it, it occurred to me that it would be a good thing just to discuss with your students. What are those two mindsets and just make them aware mm -hmm. that, that there are different ways of approaching tasks and, uh, and, and life and work. And um, even if uh, there is, there isn't anything particular that you might, want to do in the classroom um, I'm sure there are things you can do but but just make them aware that there are different mindsets to have and then mm -hmm. let them uh, think about it and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps over time they can maybe uh, if they don't have a growth mindset they can perhaps try to move towards one right okay so it's through basically reflecting on these two processes which we can encourage our learners to develop that kind of mindset growth mindset yes okay interesting i think it also comes down to the type of assessments that we design and set you know an essay or a multi-choice exam is not going to promote uh, mm -hmm. a growth mindset it's pretty much a fixed mindset approach so mm -hmm. you know looking at more problem-based learning project-based 
that's really open and to individual interpretation and mm-hmm. and creativity is, is is one way to approach that. Right, excellent, good. Thank you very much. Now uh, the second task is workplaces are learning sides to be effective members of one's workplace, one needs to take ownership of his or her learning. Uh, Discuss some practical ways graduates could do to self-regulate and take ownership of their own learning in their workplace and beyond. So uh, how could we promote that kind of mentality among our learners that, uh, you know, they should actually look at anywhere they go, any workplace, any community they go as, a learning site and learn from it and then take ownership of their own learning. Can you share some of your experiences in this regard, please? Well, I think this is where a, something like a reflective journal, a student's own journal or a blog, um, you know, diary type of approach uh, to learning really comes in where they can um, keep a record of their learning not just in the classroom, but in informal places as well, and reflect upon it. Um, so once again, I mean, students are driven by assessment, so it's also building that into the assessed activity of the course, that reflection process, that that journal. Um, you know, every student has a smartphone these days, so they can be taking photos or they could be interviewing people, uh, audio, et cetera, and then putting mm-hmm. stuff onto their, their blog. That's very interesting. Thanks, Tom. Hmm. I think as well, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, so just as well, building on that, the, the idea of a portfolio or an e-portfolio where um, uh, understanding that the, pu- the purpose is to kind of hone their craft and, and de- develop their practice. Um, and, and then they, they kind of, they understand that the, the, the artifacts or the reflections that they kind of build into that are um, about you know, taking ownership of their own learning for their craft, future craft. Mm-hmm. I think part of the key too as well with, with um, e-portfolios or journaling really is getting across to students. It's not about coming up with a final, you know, polished product, but it's about recording the process, about recording their thoughts and feelings and how they came to solutions. Because that's what people want to see is, how did you do that? Rather than, okay, well, here's what you've created, but I want to know how you got there. I agree. Very interesting. So the third task is about uh, discuss the significance of learning from mistakes and reflecting on one's practice. Now give examples from your own experience and mention a real case where you learned from your experience through critical reflection, particularly with regards to a mistake that you yourself made. So what did you learn from that mistake? And are mistakes generally bad things? What do you think? Yes, Neil. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to answer about myself, but just... <laughs> I, I That's fine. I teach uh, English in Japan to ma- mainly Japanese learners, and this is a massive issue for them, is that uh, they, they're sort of brought up, these are university students, but in the school system, um, they're brought up, um, really avoiding mistakes and, and feeling very bad if they make mistakes and and it's a, a huge challenge to say exactly what you're saying which is it's a great opportunity is to learn from your mistakes and um, and how to how to um, encourage students you know to fail uh, in, a, in a, again and again when they come from a culture where it's so, it's so, it is so strong um, that they 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 shouldn't make a mistake and and mm-hmm. and there's a lot of um, um, public shaming in Japan on the TV every day. You get companies <laughs> with their presidents are, are bowing, saying they're sorry for having made a mistake. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it it's, it's it's so difficult, I think, to to overcome that that cultural um, uh, effect in students. So I really, really think it's a very, very important thing to do. But, but there are some places and areas where it's very, very difficult to, to, to overcome that. Um, uh, thank you very much, Neil. Over. <laughs> Tom, any, do you want to share your, your thoughts on this? Um, well, I guess one, one of the um, more interesting uh, papers that I've written um, 
was really about learning from the mistakes in a, in a uh, mobile learning project. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing about that was, of course, that uh, people don't tend to report upon what went wrong. Um, they don't tend to report on the mistakes they do. So most of the case studies or the literature is all very positivistic. You know, it's about, uh, you know, look at this and it's fantastic and people liked it or not. Um, but we learn so much more from our mistakes. And so actually having, uh, starting to publish about that in the literature, I think is really, really powerful. Uh, and getting that message out there that, that um, you learn through through mistakes and, and what did you learn and, and what did you do differently? So, yeah, so a conference presentation I did around that, I think had a big impact. Good. So the next question is about engagement and how you engage in learning in your own workplace. What are some of your strategies to um, actually um, work with the others in your own particular workplace? Um, in some workplaces, we have heard that um, individuals are not able to uh, you know, contribute to the discussions and conversations around. And in some others, we, we have heard that, yeah, you know, there's a lot of conversation going on and individuals, you know, uh, employees um, contribute to um, what is going on in the organization, the challenges, and they put forth, forth their ideas. Um, now I would like you to share some of your strategies about what we could do to engage more in, in our workplaces. So I think for me, one of the keys is um, having conversations and sharing ideas. And I tend to find most of that happens around, um, you know, uh, coffee, coffee breaks. And so <clears throat> actually, um, making sure that you embed into your daily routine mm -hmm. time to go and have a social uh, catch up with people because it's not just social, you start actually talking about real issues and sharing those. And um, so I think that's part of the key. And uh, in the International Journal of Academic Development, which is you know my, my area, um, one of the most read papers there is by Neil Haig, who used to be one of my colleagues here. And it talks about those uh, informal conversations around uh, around coffee as being incredibly important to um, the culture. So right, my tip. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So the concept of change is um, a very interesting topic, and our workplaces are changing. Technology has changed everything. The social media. Um, big data, um, knowledge economy, um, globalization, artificial intelligence, and also our workplaces have become very super diverse these days. So we just see that constant change all the time. Now, the, the next question I just want to ask is, how could we deal with that change at work? So think about some of the things which uh, have changed around you, for example, in your own workplace, and how you have reacted to them, or if you could just give some examples from your own experience. Any thoughts? Um, I, as I said earlier, I work in a, in a university, and uh, there's lots of change from above that I have no like for our lessons um, used to be uh, an hour and a half long and now they're 60 minutes long and they're going to be 50 minutes long and uh, have no uh, opportunity to to really do anything about it and um, you can view those changes positively or negatively and I think the way I've come to view them is just to accept that these things happen all the time <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and there isn't a lot of point in like being either resistant or terribly um, positive about them but just uh, it's somewhere in the middle and, and accept that things are always in flux and you have to if something's not changing then maybe there's, there's something going wrong so uh, th that change is a constant and you need to just uh, accept it and try and do your best uh, within that uh, framework. All right, thank you very much, Neil. Great, excellent. Now, um, 
Well, think about a challenge. The next task is think about a challenge you have recently faced at work and discuss the strategies you apply to overcome those challenges. What could we do if, you know, a problem just comes up and, um, you know, we face that challenge? What is your first strategy, strategy? What is the thing that you could do in order to overcome that challenge? Well, some of the uh, learners I've worked with, for example, um, particularly in the New Zealand context, since they have come from overseas to this context, um, come up with a lot of challenges due to the change of space, due to the change in education system, the new norms in the education system. And then they have to adapt themselves to those uh, new changes in the in the education system, for example, in their surroundings, in terms of teaching, in terms of learning, uh, in terms of um, giving each other feedback in the classroom, um, co-constructing knowledge. Um, so in the workplace, thinking about the workplace, what are some of the strategies you use in order to overcome the daily challenges? Sean's is going for coffee. Um, <laughs> mine's going for lunch, actually. Uh, try and have those uh, informal conversations with others. Sorry, Bryony, I interrupted your finger. No, yeah, I, I was going to say something very similar. And um, I really do rely on um, my colleagues. We've got a really good community of practice here, which is, um, I think, very fortunate. So we do, um, you know, we share challenges and we, we talk about, you know, um, our different experiences and how we've managed those things. So I think, yeah, relying on your colleagues is a good strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think I, relation, relationship building is um, really key. Yeah, that, that, that's very important. And what um, Briani just mentioned, that community of practice is absolutely important. I think we are just coming towards the end of this conversation, Tom. But uh, developing a community of practice is absolutely important because it is through a community of practice where we can engage effectively with our colleagues because, you know, we have the shared interests with some of our colleagues. Uh, we have um, shared values with some of them, and, and these are the people who could actually help us to overcome those possible challenges in the workplace. So talking about it, and as uh, Tom mentioned, just uh, establishing that relationship, that rapport building among colleagues at work is absolutely essential. So thank you very much. I think it's 11 o'clock, um, Tom, and we are just towards the end of, of this talk. Yeah, so thank you, Ben, and um, really interesting and a great way of modelling, um, yeah, putting into practice what you've been exploring as well by getting us to interact, which is great. And so what's, what's the next steps, Ben? What, what are you aiming for next? What's the next part of your research? So the next part of the research is, um, well, um, to go to some of these workplaces and video, audio, record interactions in the workplace and see how things get done uh, in those particular workplaces and what kind of experience, what kind of knowledge, what kind of capabilities um, the particular, in my case, graduates need in order to be able to be more effective members of their workplace communities of practice. And so it's um, using technology as well, um, you know, we could um, create um, activities for the learners, those who are not familiar with the workplace environments, um, particularly in contexts like New Zealand, and particularly for the international students who come to this context, and familiarizing them with some of the features, some of the values, some of the, um, you know, ideologies that go on in those workplaces, and how they, you know, in those workplaces, they, um, they do transactionality. They, they get things done through work, through interactions. So that, that's the next step for me. Um, that's an ethnographic piece of the study I'm just going to, to do next in my, in my next research. Great. 
Well, thanks for um, sharing with us today, Ben. And uh, I know you're a regular panel member of our of our week webinar series as well. So, thank you uh, for that. And thank you, Neil, again for joining us. And thank you, Brioni. I think Brioni, you might have joined uh, uh, once before. Great to have you here today, and uh, get a bit of representation from uh, Australia. So I know it's a little bit earlier for you. Um, it is actually a little bit earlier for Neil as well. He's uh, probably about to go and have his breakfast now. But So thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to stop the recording and that'll be the end of today's webinar. So thank you.